Views and News with Clarence Ford. Welcome back. It is 9.35 exactly. Time for the Naked Scientist. Dr. Chris Smith uh, is with us on the line to answer a variety of questions, medical questions, science questions. There is astronomy questions in as well. Let's go to a voice note, uh, Joe. Uh, good morning. It's Wilhelm from Belbo. Um, I just want to know about the gas giants or gas planets in our solar system. Uh, in what state is the gas? And also, does it have an atmosphere and what's at the core? These planets, the gas giants, are the big balls. When you see a map of our solar system, you see these enormous great bodies like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus, for example, Neptune. And they, these are much, much bigger than Earth. If you take Jupiter, our biggest planet... The diameter of Jupiter is about 10 times the diameter of the Earth. So the Earth is about uh, 6,000 kilometres down to the core. In Jupiter, that's 10 times that. If you were to go and take a sample of Jupiter, it would be made chiefly of gas. Unlike the Earth and Mars and Venus and Mercury, which are the so-called rocky worlds, the core of Jupiter might have a bit of rock in there, but most of it is not rock, it is gas. But when you've got something which is that big, where you've pulled, because of gravity, the material very tightly together, it ceases to be a wispy gas like our atmosphere, and it becomes rock solid. So if you were to try to fly a spacecraft through Jupiter, you wouldn't have to get very far into the atmosphere before it became so dense it was like running into a brick wall. And we think that these planets probably formed because they, they may have had a, a nucleus or a core at the centre of, of the planet, which was some rocky hard stuff that had some gravity to start with, and this helped it to begin to accrete and accumulate more of the gas and dust that were the materials from which our solar system formed. And in the case of these gas giants, it is chiefly hydrogen. Okay, I have a question. I, I sleepwalk, uh, Dr. Chris, and it, uh, it, it, it's really embarrassing from time to time. It's been extremely embarrassing. How can I nip that in the bud? <laughs> I don't, we, I've no idea. You could try not going to bed, but no, I really don't know. Um, is, is this something that happens every night or is it provoked by something? Because usually when someone says, I've got a problem with, the best thing to do is to take a step back and you say, well, let's think about when this happens and then try and work out why this happens. Because often things happen for a reason and there is some kind of provoking stimulus. Did a person have a particularly bad month or did something make them more unsettled than usual? Have they been sleeping badly lately? Have they got something on their mind? Is something waking them up and this is partially arousing them from sleep and then they go wandering? There might be some pattern to it. So the first thing I'd do is I'd look for the pattern and I'd try and look for the trigger and then I'd ask myself, having identified that, if I could, can I change that in order to try to make things better? And if that fails, then you move on to looking for other reasons why this may be happening and exploring the history more broadly. Has something else changed that makes this happen? Because usually, as I say, things happen for a reason and there's usually some kind of stimulus or cause for it to happen. And if you change that, it'll stop happening. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have a close look at the patterns, if they even exist. But let's go to Eleanor in Heathfield. She's on the line. Welcome, Eleanor. Uh, good morning. I've got a, a question for Dr. Smith. Uh, I have a 19 and, and a half year old grandson. He's now, I think, on his second year at varsity. He started stuttering at the age of five, and it's becoming worse and worse. We've had him at speech therapist. And I would like to know, is there any way that he can ever lose? I mean, he's a young man now. He's still stuck just badly. Yeah, it's very disabling for people who have this. And the thing that makes it worse is when people, either they themselves think about it or when, or when attention is drawn to it. And the reason it happens or the reasons it happens are, are unclear. But there seems to be some kind of feedback loop inside the brain where when you are creating speech you use your expressive speech areas and as we do this we monitor what we say so we're listening to ourselves and we're feeding back to our expressive speech centers what we think about what we're saying but in some people this either for reasons of timing or some other neurological circuitry can cause a sort of interruption in the process. So rather than you listening 
passively to what you're saying. It's almost as though the feedback of what you're saying is interrupting or affecting the flow of the generation of the speech. So it causes it to keep starting and stopping. You can actually make this happen to people because if you take a person's speech, and Clarence will know all about this because occasionally on the radio, if someone gets the, the mix wrong on the radio desk, you'll start hearing yourself coming back and if you get the latency of that set to about half a second, so you feed someone back to themselves about half a second after they said what they wanted to say, they will start stuttering and faltering all over the place. Equally, if you take someone who does have a tendency to stutter and stammer and you stop them listening to themselves, for instance, you play music or play sounds that block out the sounds of their own voice or distract your auditory system with those sounds while you're saying something, the stammering tends to improve enormously. So there has to be something to do with the way in which we self-monitor, self-censor effectively and control our speech patterns and that in people who have a tendency to stutter, it tends to become too exaggerated. And so really the worst with any kind of neurological thing, people who think about it tend to find their symptoms exaggerate and when attention is drawn to it, it tends to get worse. And when people don't get stressed and they relax, these things and the symptoms tend to get better. So a lot of the training and coaching and help that people are offered, given that we know we can't just cure it and make it go away, there's no magic thing you can press a button and it gets better. Much of the therapy for this encourages people to develop strategies where if they know that there's a certain pattern of speech that tends to make it happen, if they know that certain situations socially tend to exaggerate the problem, they work ways around it by thinking about things in advance, how they're going to smoothly execute the speech or use a different combination of words that means that instead of tripping over, they'll easily go around by not trying to say the word they struggle with, but they'll go around the problem another way. And it's all about building confidence that, well, it's not probably not going to be a problem and actually no one cares in the grand scheme of things and everyone does this a little bit anyway, so I'm not going to worry about it. And when the stress reduces, it tends to get better. But with any of these things, drawing attention to it or especially the person themselves worries about it enormously because they think this is so humiliating why I can't get my words out. Actually, no one really minds that much and everyone is sympathetic because it happens to all of us sometimes. And when you begin to tell yourself those things and then combine it with some of these other strategies like breathing strategies and so on, you can make it a lot better. Yeah, Gran, I felt your exasperation there and I hope that advice helps. Let's go to Denise in Tableview on the line. Tell us about, uh, well, ask your question, Denise. Go ahead. Hi, Clarence. Hi, Dr. Chris. Um, I was just wondering, when people blow out the candles on their birthday cake, can the germs be spread onto the cake from the spit their spittle? Oh, yes. Absolutely they can. And so when you go to a birthday party, just remind yourself when you're eating those lovely slices of icing that you're also consuming a whole host of microorganisms, including fungi, yeasts, bacteria and viruses. Don't they taste lovely? Yes, coughs and sneezes spread diseases and when someone goes whoosh and blows out the candles, they are expressing a big cloud of saliva droplets, which means all the viruses and things living in their mouth and around their mouth are all being blown in a big cloud all over everything, the people behind the cake, the plates in front of the cake and the cake itself. Uh, we're chatting to Dr. Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist, and your questions, you're welcome. This one reads, uh, hi, Dr. Chris, with the enormous speed Earth is moving, why is it that we don't have continuous wind on Earth? Well, the Earth is moving through space. This is absolutely true because the Earth is going around the sun. And don't forget, the sun is going around our galaxy, the Milky Way, and our galaxy is going around in its cluster of galaxies. So we're actually moving through space at, at, at huge velocity. And the Earth is, of course, itself spinning. It takes a day to complete one res revolution, which means if you're standing on the equator, you're doing about a thousand kilometres an hour. And if you're standing on the North Pole, you're barely moving at all. So there are wind effects because of that. But because the planet is spinning and the atmosphere is around the planet, the atmosphere is moving with the planet. And the best way to think about this is if you take a, a bowl of water, put your hand in and turn your hand in a, in a circle, in a, in a continuously in the same direction, the water will begin to form a whirlpool moving with your hand. And if you were to imagine that that was the Earth's atmosphere, the Earth is turning and the atmosphere is turning with it. So therefore you don't notice this wind 
because the, the atmosphere is coupled to the Earth's surface, so everything's moving together. And this is why flights with the rotation of the Earth take a different length of time than flights in the opposite direction, because you're either going with or fighting against the wind. And also because of these effects, you then get other wind effects across the planet. So they do produce consequences, but because the atmosphere is rotating in the same direction as the Earth, we don't notice that we're doing a 1,000 kilometres an hour plus at the equator. We should actually get a sound going when it's a light bulb moment like that. Bang! Okay, um, let's move to uh, the question. Joe, my colleague, has a question for you. He's, was it your granddaughter or your daughter, Joe? Uh, she, saw, she saw something. He's communicated that to you. Um, and he wants to explain to her why shooting stars happen. A special one for Joe. And the answer to this is shooting stars aren't stars. They look like stars because they're pinpoints of light in the sky, but they're much, much closer to us than stars. These are bits of debris, small fragments of, of rock and iron and dust, which have come in from outer space and they've hit the Earth's atmosphere. And as they come through the Earth's atmosphere, because they're going very fast, they're doing thousands of kilometres an hour. As they come in, they're compressing the atmosphere as they hit it in front of the object. And anyone who has got an engine will know that the way your engine works is you, it's a diesel engine, for example, when you compress the gas in the cylinder, it heats up because you're doing work against the gas by compressing it. And when you do work, you're using energy. And if you're using energy, you must be giving the energy to the thing you're doing the work on, which is the gas. So if you're doing work on that gas, you're giving it energy. If it's got more energy, its temperature goes up. So the air in front of the object gets hot. And this is called adiabatic heating. And it makes the air get sufficiently hot that it glows. And at the same time, this can also heat up the surface closest to the air of the object, the the, the piece of stone or, or rock and so on and this can contribute to the glowing as well and this is or this carries on until the object is burned up because the heat will eventually cause the object to fall to pieces or erode away and by the time it reaches the ground there's almost nothing left or more often nothing left but that's what a shooting star is an object coming in compressing the earth's atmosphere in front of it because it's going so fast as it compresses the atmosphere the atmosphere gets hot and glows and also burns up the object because of the, the heating effect. And this leads to the light that you see from the Earth. There we go, Joe. Joe is beaming on the other side of the studio. Uh, the question is, where is the DNA database kept of all creation uh, so that there are no duplicates? The DNA database of creation so there are no duplicates. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question unless the person is asking, is, is it true? It that there's no one else on Earth that is genetically identical to me unless I have an identical twin? And the answer yeah, is it's a numbers game. And in, in the case of humans, it's a numbers game because we have got three billion letters of genetic code in each of us. And when we make sperms and eggs, we mix up all the chromosomes that we have. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And um, when we make a sperm and make an egg, we put half of our genetic material into a, a sperm and the other half comes from the egg. So when you put those together, you get a unique combination. And it's even more cunning because as you're making the halving process of your sperm's and egg's DNA. You also swap bits between the mum's and the dad's chromosomes, matching bits like for like, and this creates further diversity. So that's how humans do it. Animals also that, that reproduce like we do, they also use this process of meiosis to muddle up their DNA so that we introduce more changes and diversity. And also there is a low mutation rate. We're making genetic mistakes when we copy our DNA in Cells like ours, that's quite a low rate, and so a parent will pass on 50 to 100 new genetic changes to their children, offspring, animals the same. And so this also further changes and evolves our genetic code by changing its, its integrity very slightly. If the question concerns where life started and the diversity of life on Earth, then you've got to go back 4 billion years, because the earliest life on Earth started maybe 4 to 4.1 billion years ago, when the planet was only a four 500 million years old. Those first life forms were very primitive. They were like microorganisms, some kind of um, bacterial-like organisms. They hung around for billions of years uh, and, and did not very much, apart from exist producing more of the same and then 
sometime around um, a billion to 800 million years ago, things began to change. And by 500 million years ago, we had an enormous diversity of things springing up because things began to change. Cells had evolved in a different way and the environment of the planet had begun to change in such a way that it facilitated and encouraged the diversity and rich tapestry of life that we have today. And so we all come, all of us are here from one ancestor which was actually a bacterial-like thing. And the reason we know that must be true is I can take a gene from me and I can put it into a cell from one of the most primitive organisms on Earth and the most primitive organism on Earth's cells will understand my genetic code and vice versa. And the only way you can explain that is if we all have one common ancestor from which we are descended through the process of evolution over millions to billions of years. Bing! It's that kind of sound, that light bulb moment. Joe is going to get that sound for us next next week. Uh, Dr. Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist, is with us till 10. Uh, Anwar in Simonstown is on the line. Anwar, go ahead for Dr. Chris. Hi. Hi, Dr. Chris. Morning. I, I, I'm, doing some, I'm preparing some lectures on the cell. And one of the things I'm going to say is that we have this whole lot of macromolecules who arrange themselves into a cell and something new emerged. So the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Now we've got this thing called life. So the cell is alive. But now there's a couple of theories about how this happened. Richard Dawkins says came about by gene. And Nick Lane of UCL is saying life is energy. Electricity. It's nothing to do with information. <laughs> what is life? <laughs> how do you define without being a vitalist? How do you define it? I, I love it. And why? Um, uh, th- uh, thank you for that question, Do- uh, Dr. Chris Smith. Well, we regard life as a series of pro- of processes, biochemical reactions, that are self perpetuating. And winding the clock back to that four billion years ago that I mentioned about life starting on Earth, we know for a fact that life got going here pretty quickly. And we know for a fact that the earliest life were these primitive microorganisms, probably something resembling bacteria or cyanobacteria, which photosynthesize. They can use energy from the sun and turn that into useful chemicals that enable them to then flourish and grow. We also know, thanks to work done in South Africa, actually, that microorganisms can survive on radioactivity. Samples collected from deep gold mines near Johannesburg were able to prove that there are microbial communities which are living off of the energy spat out by uh, decaying radio, uh, radiation, uranium, in the rocks. So microorganisms are pretty good at exploiting energy sources. So how do they get going in the first place? Well, in order to exploit those energy sources, you need some kind of structures or some kind of biochemistry, an ability to constrain and control the chemistry. And for that to happen, you need some kind of environment that you can control. For that to happen, you probably need some kind of membrane. So when we think about the earliest life, it's probably not a coincidence that these microorganisms, these bacteria-like things, had membranes because that meant they had something which was like an enclosed bag where they had different chemistry and different substances which they could change in concentration inside compared to outside in order to harness various chemical processes to provide a supply of energy. And then you've got the problem, well, what are they actually doing? Well, how are they coordinating themselves? Well, they need some way of storing information. So we think that upstream of having that bag, there must have been the information. So that was probably the genetic code. And some genetic code material can actually also function as an enzyme like RNA, one of the chemical relatives of DNA, doesn't just store genetic information, it can also have structure and function and behave like an enzyme. It can actually be an enzyme, it can make chemical reactions happen. So One speculation is that we start with primitive forms of genetic material which begin to self-replicate but then their needs become more advanced and by enclosing themselves in a membrane they can control the environment and become even more advanced and this gives them all kinds of exciting chemistries and more energy supply and then life kind of stutters for a while and doesn't evolve very much until then those cells begin to team up together and form groups of cells, metazoal life, And that then unlocks the door to producing much more complicated forms of life, uh, ultimately turning into us. But there's a lot of unknowns in there. 
and we really don't know how life processes got started but people are trying to find out not just studying this planet but going to other planets and there are a lot of missions which are now being launched into space uh, one going to Jupiter, Europa, for example, that, that launches this year, which is going to try to study an ocean which we think is beneath the icy surface of Europa, which may be warm water and the sort of environment that we think reflects a bit like the early Earth, the conditions that were here. And therefore, it might give us insights into how these sorts of processes were happening. Wow. OK, there's a whole lot to think about again. And, and that happens when the naked scientist takes to the air. Dr. Chris Smith, we thank you for your time once again. Every Friday, just after 9.30, think about your questions.